Even though what you see right here kind of looks like a star map, essentially something you would see in a night skies, what you are looking at right now is actually a map of black holes. This right here is the first ever produced map of actual black holes in a night skies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and let's talk about this new discovery or this new study that came out very recently that essentially created this. The relatively small, yet somehow extremely huge map of the black holes in the night skies. But first of all, let's start here with the size comparison. As you can see, this little circle represents the size of the moon. And this huge chunk produced by the scientists is essentially what they were able to create with each and every single dot being essentially a supermassive black hole somewhere far, far away. The brighter the dot, the more likely the mass of the black hole. And every single one of these approximately 25,000 or so dots is basically a black hole that's consuming a lot of mass, producing really, really large astrophysical jets, and also producing a lot of emissions in different frequencies, including emissions coming from the accretion disk. So in other words, we're not really looking at black holes that would seem very similar to this one, these so-called stellar mass black holes. What we are actually looking at are most likely these giant black holes often located in a typical center of a galaxy. Obviously, not all of them are probably in the center of the galaxy, and some of them might actually allow us to study certain mysteries of the universe, but the vast majority of dots in this picture are basically these central black holes in different galaxies. But I guess in some sense, this is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, we do believe that black holes do not allow light to escape. So how this light is produced is, of course, a pretty interesting question. And in general, we think that this is produced in the accretion disks, not really in the black holes themselves. So essentially, this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at these very powerful frequencies, very powerful light coming from the accretion disk close to the black hole. And generally, depending on the energy and also depending on the distance from the black hole, different frequencies of light will be produced. And in this particular case, what we're looking at are essentially radio frequencies. Here's actually what all of this looks like if you were to look at the unprocessed version. Or basically if we were to look at the raw data with one object in particular being extremely bright. And this object is very well known to us. The galaxy that you see right here known as 3C295, a relatively small radio galaxy that also surprisingly is extremely powerful and also possesses a tremendous amount of mass. As a matter of fact, it's believed to be one of the most massive galactic clusters and galaxies in the universe at least as of a few decades ago. And so many of these objects and many of these different galaxies became visible to us by using this new technique that the scientists developed. But the thing is, this took years and years of work. And years and years of observation using Europe's LOFAR, Low Frequency Array. But it's not just one telescope like you see right here. This is literally a Europe-sized radio telescope. And this network of telescope contains roughly around 20,000 different radio antennas forming what's known as interferometric network, with roughly around 52 different locations across Europe. So basically this is an extremely accurate and relatively large in size telescope, but does rely on a lot of observation from several different spots in Europe, with many as you can see right here being present in Netherlands in the so-called LOFAR core. But generally, the accretion disks of black holes are able to produce a lot of different frequencies. And because of this, the scientists had to focus on one frequency that they know would not have any interference and would be sort of visible through the atmosphere of planet Earth. A lot of frequencies, like for example ultraviolet frequencies, get absorbed by Earth. For example, in this image from NASA, we can kind of see the what's known as atmospheric opacity or essentially which frequencies can usually go through the atmosphere. And so here, as you can see, certain frequencies of light, visual light, do go through to some extent. But the infrared spectrum, the higher energy light, such as gamma rays and x-rays, and some of the extremely long wavelengths of radio light are not able to penetrate our atmosphere and essentially get absorbed. However, the majority of radio waves are observable, and specifically there is actually a region right here that hasn't really been explored much. The extremely low frequency radio waves. Now generally some of the previous studies already established that extremely or ultra low frequencies are usually reflected back into space by the ionosphere of our planet. So essentially they kind of bounce off as if it was a mirror. And that's usually below the frequency of about 5 MHz or so. 
but certain low frequencies, depending on the atmospheric conditions, do go through the atmosphere and can easily be observed from planet Earth as well. And it just so happens that the LOFAR is the only telescope on the planet that's able to observe frequencies below 100 MHz and produce really high quality images by using thousands of different radio antenna located in Europe. And for this study, the scientists looked at frequencies of about 42 to 66 megahertz, which were still affected by the ionosphere of our planet to some extent. And because of this, to counteract the effects from the ionosphere and possible disturbances, the scientists had to use a supercomputer to essentially correct any kind of interference or any kind of errors produced by the interaction of radio waves with the ionosphere as it passed through it. This was apparently done every four seconds, and overall, had to be done for about 256 hours, which means that they had to do these calculations over 200,000 times. And following this extremely thorough analysis and a lot of calculations, the scientists were then able to convert all of these radio frequencies into this beautiful image of the patch of the night skies that you see right here, with every one of these points representing a supermassive black hole producing these low frequency radio waves. And once again, this point right here representing that famous galaxy 3C295. But because of these corrections for the ionospheric interference, a lot of data was produced on the actual ionosphere as well. And in some sense, this is actually a kind of a double success. On the one hand, we have this new map now, but on the other hand, we also have this data of approximately 250 hours of essentially calculations showing us what happens in the ionosphere as the radio wave light passes through it and interacts with it. More specifically, it might actually allow us to study the effects from the sun. As the ionosphere is affected by the sun, we can actually use this data to now analyze the effects from the solar flares and solar activity on the Earth's ionosphere. At the same time, what this map might actually show us are, well, a lot of undiscovered objects, a lot of objects that have never been seen before, specifically in frequencies between approximately 40 to 50 megahertz. So some of these points that you see right here might be objects we never knew existed until this particular study. We don't really know what they are yet and if they're even there, but this is a possibility coming out of this particular discovery. And since this survey here looked at roughly around 1 million different objects, it's obviously going to be really important to see if we can actually find some kind of a new object nobody ever knew existed. But until we know what's here and until we know what's not here, for now all we have is the actual map and honestly it looks kind of beautiful. On that note though, that's kind of all I wanted to mention. Check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support the channel Patreon by joining the YouTube membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.